the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us pray. On my heart, imprint your image, blessed Jesus, King of grace, that life's riches, cares, and pleasures never may your work erase. Let the clear inscription be, Jesus crucified for me, is my life, my hope's foundation, and my glory and salvation. Amen. Soren Kierkegaard, a 19th century existentialist philosopher, mused on the ethical life of Abraham, saying, before the result, meaning before Abraham saw the ram in the thicket, before the result, either Abraham was every minute a murderer, or we are confronted by a paradox which is higher than all mediation. Human reason, philosophy, and ethics can't explain or harmonize the Old Testament text today with a merciful God. Why would murder ever be right or ethical? Why would the man of faith kill his only son? Why would the God who creates life and commands his creation not only to preserve life but to be fruitful and multiply order Abraham to kill his own son Isaac? According to Mr. Kierkegaard and man-made philosophy there is no reason for God to tell Abraham to kill his son Isaac. Remember, was it not God who said in Genesis 9, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Why would God command man not to kill and then organize the death of Abraham's son? Better yet, remember what Abraham's God said to Abraham concerning his son Isaac. He said concerning Isaac that I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. How could God establish an everlasting covenant, including offspring, if Isaac was nothing but ashes? God is either a liar because he breaks his promise or never really means it with Abraham, or he is Abraham's enemy because he reverses and goes back on his word. At first glance, God is either a liar or Abraham's enemy, as Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, after these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. How many of you have glanced at this reading and never pondered the immense despair that it brings? How many of you parents were able to actually listen to that reading and not ponder your own children? Well, the problem is with Scripture nowadays, no one actually listens to it. So let's take a modern example. Since that Bible's too old to realize the immense problem going under, let's take a modern example. Imagine this. Imagine this. Let's paint a picture here. Imagine you came into church this morning and right in front of this lovely altar that sits the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine in front of it was this makeshift altar surrounded with a bunch of sticks and wood. And next to it stands me, your pastor. And in one of my arms, I hold my eldest son. And in the other hand, I hold a knife. And then I took my eldest son, and I put him on the altar. My son, who I would die for, who I love 
even though sometimes it's hard to love, I love them to death. And I put him on that altar. I bound him up. I put all the lighter fluid all over it and lit the altar and raised the blade ready to sacrifice him. What would all of you do? Would you sit there and say, Man, pastor is one man of faith. Would you think I am of sound mind and body? Would you sit to your fellow pew sitter and go, man, I'm sure God told pastor to do that. That's why he's doing it. We must trust him. No, you wouldn't do any of that. Hopefully, you would rush to the altar quickly as possible, tackle me, throw the knife out of my hand, grab my son off of the altar and run the opposite way, pin me down on the ground, call 911 and hold me there until the police show up. And then once they get here, you'd see them cart me away, kicking and screaming, going, I swear God told me to do it. You'd remove my picture from the hallway. You would erase my name from every church document. And you'd pretend you never even knew I existed. You wouldn't come see me in the insane asylum. Nor would you pray for me to get better. You'd try to forget me as soon as possible. Yet when we read this story of Abraham, we call him the man of faith, as Paul calls him in Galatians 4. Realize the extremity of the situation. God is not asking Abraham to spank his son. No, in divine eternal authority, God is telling Abraham to kill his only son, the son of promise, Isaac. And God is not tempting Abraham to sin, for that is the work of the devil. No, God is testing Abraham in order to exercise his faith and trust in him. But why such an intense trial? Why not tell Abraham to end his own life? Why not tell Abraham to sacrifice all of his workers and animals and live a pauper's life? Why command Abraham to kill Isaac? Because it completely contradicts the promise that through Isaac will come the promised seed of Eve. This command tries Abraham's faith in the promise of the Messiah. We know this by the prayer of Abraham as he walks with Isaac to the mountain. He prays God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering my son. Abraham wasn't lying to his son to calm his emotions before they got to the mountain. No, Abraham, inspired by the Holy Spirit, prophesied that God would provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham wasn't guided by his own reason and emotions. He took his time getting to the mountain because of the heavy command that the Lord gave to him. However, it wasn't blind obedience that led Abraham to the mountain, but spirit-given faith that directed Abraham to Moriah. The Spirit led Abraham to deny all despair and logic in order to slaughter his son for the Lord. Abraham lifted the knife in faith that the Lord would provide. He raised the blade in full trust that God would not let the seed die, but that Isaac would live because of faith given to him by the Holy Spirit. Abraham trusted that God would provide the sacrifice in the stead of his son. Outside of faith, as Mr. Kierkegaard understood it, this text portrays Abraham as either a murderer or a paradox that surpasses all universal ethics. However, it is by faith that Abraham acted in complete trust toward God. And it's the same with you today. 
How many of you would sacrifice your most loved one if God commanded you to do so? Anybody here? No? I'm glad that God hasn't asked Allison to do that, you know. I don't know if I'm worth more living or gone. I don't know. Well, let's get basic. Instead of that question, how many of you would sacrifice breakfast if God asked you to do so for him? Now, I'm not talking a bowl of oatmeal. I'm talking a nice breakfast. Like one of those nice brunches you pay 22 bucks for and you get the nice food with it, the guy who makes an omelet for you. That type of breakfast. How many of you would sacrifice your weekends, not just an hour or two on Sunday, but your entire weekend, starting from the moment you get off Friday at work all the way till Monday when you go back to work and sit in here praying to God and receiving His gifts all weekend long? How many of you would give up, not for financial gain, but solely because God told you to do so, how many of you would give up house? and car, job, friends, and family for God? How many of you would give up your good reputation or your 401k for God? How many of you would give up 15 to 20 minutes of your undivided attention while the Word is proclaimed to you for God? Or in the other way, how many of you trust in God completely that he is faithful to his promise. When tested, when life is tough and it seems that God doesn't love you, how many of you remain faithful in prayer toward God? When God tests us, we usually despair of his love or we get angry at him and deny him. We question His forgiveness. We question our baptism. If God makes me His child, why does He let bad things happen to me during this life? How many of you have thought that way before? If God loves you, why do things just keep going wrong? Stop thinking this way. I know that all of you have thought this way at least sometime in your life. And even if it was only for a moment, you've had these thoughts, thoughts of despair and anxiety that God doesn't love you. These thoughts are the devil's fiery arrows cast into your heart by his demonic forces and received by the old Adam. The devil be gone from you. Repent, take heart. Just believe. St. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, declared Abraham to be the man of faith. He wasn't the man of faith because of his obedience to God. No, Abraham trusted in God and walked according to his commandments because of God's promise to Abraham. Abraham received the promise as the angel of the Lord guided Abraham's eyes to turn around, for behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. Outside of faith, you and I are not only ignorant of the merciful God, but we are his enemies. However, because of the incarnate promise of the cross, you and I are declared holy and righteous in the sight of our Heavenly Father. The faith of Jesus Christ is given to each and every one of you, that faith which receives the glorious waters of holy baptism for the forgiveness of your sin. There in the font did you and I receive the Holy Spirit who works faith within us that trusts that Jesus forgives us our sin. Outside of faith, we see God as a liar because we still suffer in this world or we despair because we think God is angry with us. God tests only His true and beloved saints. God does not test 
the weak ones, but only his beloved ones. Like me giving a hard time to my compromands, I only do it to the ones I know can take it. That's maybe some confidence to a girl from last year. God does not test, as Luther said, in order that we may fear and hate him like a tyrant, but to the end that he may exercise and stir up faith and love in us. You have the promise declared to you this day. Christ has died in your stead on the cross. This is no lie, but the solid gospel truth. It is no longer you who suffers the wrath of the Father. No, Jesus has taken your place at Calvary and died your death in order that you may have his life. This is the promise that brought comfort to Abraham's heart, and it is the same promise for you this day. God is no liar, and he is not angry with those who are in Christ. Jesus, the Father adores you just as he loves his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Take heart, little flock. Let not the devil drag you into despair, nor the world convince you that God is angry with you. Yes, you've sinned. Take heart. Christ has become sin for you that you may be forgiven this day. Hear the blessed promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. I forgive you your sin. And because you are forgiven, you have life instead of death, salvation instead of slavery to the devil. Let us take comfort in the sacrifice of Isaac, knowing that our Father has sacrificed His only begotten Son for us in order that we may not die eternally. Take heart. Your sin is forgiven. Your name is written in the book of life. God is not a liar. He speaks only the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.